What is going on, I have Warriors? It's your boy Edward V, and today we're going to talk about a study that was just released this month, April 17th, 2020, looking at intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding versus normal dieting. The study was published in the Nutrients Journal and was run by Matthew T. Stratton and colleagues. However, this study has an interesting outcome. It shows that there were no differences between the intermittent fasting group, the time-restricted feeding group, and the normal dieting group. Hey Edward, what gives? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and break it down in this video. Stay tuned. Okay, quickly before we dive into the topic, this video is brought to you by The Coldest Water. If you're still shopping around for a water bottle that you feel will keep your water cold for the longest period of time, all you have to do is go ahead and get The Coldest Water water bottle because it can keep your water cold for a minimum 36 hours. If you want to get your Coldest Water water bottle, the link will be down in the description and you can use the promo code FLEDGE you'll get 10% off your entire order. Now let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Okay, so this is an important study that came out. Yes, there are limitations to the study, but the findings of the study are important. Data is always data, and I wanna be able to bring that data to you so that you can have a bigger picture of the information that we have scientifically regarding intermittent fasting. So now let me go ahead and break down the methodology of this study, how they constructed this study. They were able to get 26 men to fully complete the process. They had other people come in, but they had to omit people for certain reasons. Two or three people dropped out from the normal dieting group and also the time-restricted feeding group. So when it was all said and done with the analysis, 26 people were included in the final data and they split them evenly. There were 13 people in the time-restricted feeding group and 13 people in the normal dieting group. Now, what they did is, as I mentioned in my previous video when I was talking about the studies and how they tried to equate for protein, they equated for protein intake to ensure that this was not going to give some sort of benefit or handicap to any of the groups because protein is very thermogenic, more thermogenic than carbs and fats. So they equated for protein and made sure that that was equal across the board. And this was a resistance train male setup. So they wanted to make sure that they actually allowed them the possibility to either retain or grow muscle. So they went with 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day for each group that is within the international society of sports nutrition recommendation for the amount that you need based on the multitude of studies that we have in terms of growing muscle or retaining muscle so they were within that recommended amount so that they could provide a diet that is properly set up to succeed when doing resistance training. Now, all of the participants that were taking part in this study were already recreationally active. And by recreationally active, they defined it in the study as men within the span of six months have been actively training resistance training for about three to four times a week. If they were doing this consistently for that time frame, they were allowed within the study. So this is already resistance trained male who are now doing resistance training within the protocol of either time restricted feeding or normal dieting. The age was averaged around 22 to 23 years of age for both the time restricted feeding group and the normal dieting group. And the study lasted for about four weeks. Now keep in mind I've already done a study breakdown using this similar methodology within resistance trained males that was an eight week period. And I'm going to kind of compare and contrast it once I'm done breaking down this study. This was four weeks of supervised resistance training. However, with a dietary log where the participants log their own dietary intake per day throughout the diet process, they would intermittently check the diet log to see if they were adhering to the actual diet. Now they ran the gamut on this study in terms of what they were testing. They looked at body composition, body mass, fat-free mass, which is a focus on the lean tissue, body fat percentage. They looked at blood plasma to see hormone levels of 
leptin and ghrelin and cortisol. They even looked at muscle growth within the biceps, the legs, different parts of the body to see if there were parts that were growing for one group better than the other. They looked at so many different factors, which is what makes this study pretty interesting is how deep they went with the data that they were looking for. They had 16 visits total with the group just to assess if they were following the protocol. And the findings showed in most of the body composition analysis, most of it was all the same. The outcome was the same. There wasn't anything better for the uh, normal dieting group than there was for the intermittent fasting group and vice versa. Now, keep in mind that the time-restricted feeding group were doing the 16-8 model, the 16-8 intermittent fasting model where you eat for eight hours, but you fast for 16 hours throughout the day, which is the same model used in that previous eight-week study that I mentioned. And they use things like dual energy x-ray absorptiometry to look at the actual body fat percentage. So it was pretty detailed. And still, they found no significant differences in terms of body fat reduction, muscle growth or lack thereof, fat-free mass, and so on and so forth. So body composition elements were the same. They were the same across the board. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that this is still an important study. Not all studies that come out are going to say that intermittent fasting beats normal dieting. It's just not going to happen because there's so many types of variations in terms of how you can set up a study, the methodology, the systematic approach to a study. But we have to look at the details inside of the study so that we can get clues as to what the differences are within that structure. What separates the time-restricted feeding group versus the normal dieting group? Now, one thing that I did like is that it is a randomized controlled study. However, it wasn't a crossover design and the crossover design does lend itself to more accurate accuracy because you can see if what happens when you cross the groups over and have them do the opposite thing if there's a similar result or a similar outcome when they flipped over to do the opposite protocol they did not do that in this study but we have to work with what we have and data is still data but interestingly enough what you find within the study itself are certain outcomes and one that they highlighted and a few others that they didn't really highlight but I'm going to go ahead and highlight for you in this review of that study. The first thing which they highlighted and they talked about was the plasma cortisol increase. So cortisol was increased in the normal dieting group. Now this is the stress hormone. This is a stress hormone that goes up. Now understand that cortisol in and of itself isn't bad. You do need cortisol for things like resistance training because it helps you in terms of the muscle rehabilitation process and helping you rebuild the muscle tissue that's torn during resistance training. But it was higher in the normal dieting group. Now keep in mind that muscle growth muscle retention, everything was the same between both groups. There wasn't a limitation to the fact that people were fasting versus the fact that people were not fasting. As much as anti-intermittent fasting people would want you to believe, this study still shows that there is no difference. Building muscle, being successful, increasing muscle tissue, increasing weight resistance, it's all the same across the board, even though one group is fasting and one group isn't. In terms of cortisol being something that was positive in terms of what the results were for body composition and for strength increase, it was the same for both groups but cortisol was still higher in the normal dieting group, which shows that stress level was higher in that group. Cortisol is a stress hormone. So if it's consistently high or it's higher for one group versus the other without providing any additional benefits to it, well, basically this is giving you detriments, not benefits, but detriments. Although it's not crazy, it is still a significant difference. And keep in mind that this study was only four weeks. So if you amplify this to eight weeks, 12 weeks, you don't know what the regression would be moving forward. We just know that looking at this study by itself, isolated within this four weeks, cortisol was higher, significantly higher in that group. Now, other parts of the plasma concentration that they looked at where there were differences, although not significantly different, was in, for example, ghrelin. Now, you know that ghrelin is the hunger hormone, and many would have you believe that if you do intermittent fasting or if you fast, ghrelin is going to go up you're going to be hungrier when you fast. That is just a fact because you're just using one plus one equals two kind of logic where you think, well, if you're not eating, won't you be hungry because you're not eating? That is not the case. The body has the ability to adapt and even overcorrect itself when they're in situations where they're fasting. Because in this study, 
Gremlin, yes, it did go up because, of course, Gremlin is going to go up when you're reducing weight. They were at a caloric deficit. Keep in mind, Gremlin will go up when you're in a when you're in a calorie deficit situation because your body wants to try to bring you back to that set point. So things like Gremlin are going to work against you to try to get you there. But it still went up way less in the intermittent fasting group than the normal dieting group. Keep in mind, calorie and protein were equated. So this has nothing to do with the food intake in and of itself. It has to do with the intermittent fasting protocol. The increase of Gremlin is suppressed more aggressively in the intermittent fasting group than it is with the normal dieting group. Another plasma difference that they saw was in leptin. Leptin was also decreased, but it was decreased less in the intermittent fasting group than it was with the normal dieting group. And what's leptin? Leptin is the hormone that tells you you're full. Leptin is the hormone that actually tells you stop eating. It sends that signal to your brain. It tells you that you are satisfied, that you're done. This was reduced much more in the normal dieting group than it was with the fasting group. Now, once again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but you understand that the protein and calories were equated for. The meals were equated for. So there is not anything different in what they're eating or what they're doing in terms of resistance training. The only difference is the protocol in terms of fasting or not fasting. Super important elements that they didn't talk about, I guess because it wasn't I guess significant in terms of the p value being being less than 0.05 but still something to look at it's data and like i said it was only a four-week study so we don't know the compounding elements of what would happen if you continued and what this would do for weight loss fat loss body fat loss we don't know what this would do if you continued the process past four weeks now to quickly summarize this and kind of bring into effect the eight week study that i that i've mentioned many times before the eight week study had a very similar methodology system as this study did where you have resistance trained males that are used to doing resistance training and all of that and then they're put into a study where they're doing normal dieting versus time restricted feeding in the eight week study using a very similar design and even the diet log setup body fat reduction was significant in the intermittent fasting group the the 16 8 group in this study we didn't see that but maybe it's because the compounding element we didn't reach it yet with just the four weeks and maybe it would take eight weeks to see it or maybe six weeks who knows and if you look at the study as a whole if you just look at the abstract and just look at what the conclusion is you can say well oh this proves that intermittent fasting and a normal dieting doesn't there's no difference there's nothing different but you do have to take a lot of things with a grain of salt a diet log system is basically the person writing what they ate and giving that to the researchers not the researcher putting them in a metabolic chamber to see that they're actually eating that something that's more stringent and is more difficult to put together but it's much more accurate in terms of adherence so you have to understand that the limitation in how many people there were there were only 22 people the limitations in what type of people they are which is resistance trained males doing resistance training what happens if you take someone who's overweight and does resistance training or what, what happens if you mix in men and women or what happens if you mix in people that are older these are things that you have to take into account. It may not apply to you. And with the small sample size, the small amount of time, and the very and the very linear sample size of just being men who are resistance trained, doing resistance training, that could bring about minimal changes. And that's probably why we see the minimal changes here. Never look at a study, look at the abstract, and think that this is the be all to end all. Remember, meta-analysis is the hierarchy of research understanding. When we get something from meta-analysis, that gives us much more data that we have much more confidence in presenting that information to you to say this is telling us if you do this, this may happen and we have more confidence in, in delivering that. But in this study, like I said, data is always data. So it's an important study. It's something that we want to look at, something that we want to pay attention to but it is not by any means the be all end all. Of course, all of the studies that I mentioned in this video will be linked down in the description below. And of course, I wanna thank my patrons from my Patreon. I'm gonna go ahead and put their names right up here.
And as always, guys, I'll see you on Wednesday for another FAQ. Peace!